G'day everybody, and for those who have come in late, you're listening to X Ben the Phantom Podcast. He washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice, and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evil doers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks! The Phantom! Enemies beware! The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team, and this is X Band the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, and you can also contact us via our email, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us via YouTube, iTunes, or ver- the various Android apps. This is episode 187, which is our April 2021 comics and news. Uh, my name is Jermaine, and Dan, how are you, buddy? Yeah, really good, Jim. It's uh, good to be good to be catching up with you. An unusual time of the day for us to be recording. We're sitting here. Uh, <laughs> it's ten o'clock in the morning my time. Uh, what eight o'clock in the morning your time? Um, that's almost twelve hours wrong <laughs> for us to be. We're usually this sort of time at night. Um, yes. But it's the it's a long weekend for me, and you're in lockdown, so we've got no work <laughs> to go to. And uh, so it's good to be to be sitting around talking fan. I'm just uh, weird to see the sunlight coming through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've done a couple where we've gotten up early and then the sun rises as we talk. Yes. I remember doing one with um, Tony D. Paul where it was kind of the, you know, the opposite. It started off daylight for him and then by the end of it, you couldn't actually yes. see him because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he forgot to turn the light on. But One, um, <laughs> one of my favourite overnighters was the first time we spoke to Cy Barry and I just, because it was a Sunday morning when... Um, uh, as we finished up and, and dawn was cracking over the horizon and I was so chuffed with the fact that we'd just spoken to Cy Barry. It might have been dawn, but I cracked a beer out of the fridge and went out and watched the sunrise <laughs> with a beer, thinking about how good that was to talk to Cy. <laughs> was, it a, was it a 4X? Uh, I can't remember, mate, but it wouldn't have been a 4X <laughs> because uh, I hate that stuff. A <laughs> uh, Queensland is allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah, mate, yeah. It's not the 1980s anymore. <laughs> All right, so we try and keep these podcasts as short as possible, uh, and with our comics and news, we try and do them uh, once a month. Now, our last comics and news was a bumper one. Hopefully, it won't be uh, a bumper one, this one, and we don't have to split it up into two. Uh, We will try. Whether we're successful or not uh, remains to be seen. Well, there's a lot lot fewer comics that have come out, and, uh, and last month, March, just all of the things that had been promised for so long all sort of arrived. So we don't have the games, that, we don't have the everything arriving um, this month. So it uh, yes. should be quick. Exactly. And a huge shout out to all those people that uh, emailed us with the with the keyword. Uh, we, we had more than five people uh, message us, so that means that we have more than five listeners. So uh, <laughs> thank you for those uh, five to ten <laughs> listeners. Um, I do think we made it easy for them because when we when we talked about the keyword, that was it was still going to be a one episode, two and a half hour long thing uh, that would have been more challenging for people to get through. By the time we broke it up, you only had to listen to uh, two an hour or so. But uh, no, you're right. It was really cool to get to get all of those uh, people messaging in and. Uh, a little bit of gratification to go, well, actually, there are people who listen to it, so it's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start off with the comics. We're going to get straight into it. So we've got three comics, three through comics to review. We've got uh, one eight, uh, eight, nine, uh, which is the beautiful cover from uh, Alex Tripp. Then we've got uh, one eight ninety. Now, I haven't scanned these in, so I can't show them as we're talking. Um, and then 1891, which will probably be our shortest comic review. Might, maybe not as short as Nick, uh, Nick Mole's review that he's put up on Facebook, but um, yeah, it will probably be short as well. So we'll get straight into it. So we're going to talk about uh, these two comics because it's a part one and a part two. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the covers. So the first one, we've got 18. Eight nine, which is a beautiful uh, front and back cover from Alex Tripp. Um, really dynamic shot of the Phantom crashing through the window. This blew me away as soon as I, or should I say, knocked me down through the glass plate window when I <laughs> saw it. Uh, and this amazing uh, angle shot of running on the on the train as well was another great shot. So, um, uh, what did you think of that cover, mate? 
Oh, I was like you. I was blown away by the um, the front cover in particular, the the dynamic nature of the picture, and you know you've got the shards of glass that are just flying. You've got the expression on the Phantom's face. Uh, the two bad guys who are realizing that um, you know that they're in trouble, and and also the expression on the um, uh, the princess's face as well. Um, you know, you you really get that sense of. Um, uh, of terror in in and in, in, in upset in, in her situation. So no, that that whole front cover. Um, without going back and having a proper look at the rest of them, I think this might be my favourite for the year mm. so far. Um, yeah. Just with how dynamic it is, complemented by the the one on the back. I think it's really well suited as a as a back cover. It could easily have been a front cover as well, but to complement uh, to have these two uh, complement each other is uh, is really cool. And I just love. I, I really do like Alex's work. Um, the the, the way he um, depicts the Phantom is is muscly, but not overly muscular, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, really dynamic cover. I really like this one. Now, before I talk about I just want to, I'm just going to try and share my screen. For those on YouTube, uh, we do show things and stuff like that. So if you like to see things while we're talking, YouTube is the way to go. So I must say, while you're getting that up too, I really, uh, really appreciating all the comments we're getting on our YouTube um, side at the moment. Just about every every podcast we put up gets a, a range of um, um, comments mm. and that sort of thing. So it's really cool. So thanks to those on YouTube who are commenting uh, underneath the video. Yeah, so now for those on YouTube, you'll see this. This is uh, a Moonstone cover from Doug Calaba uh, from number nine. Now, um, you will see that it is, uh, can you see that? There's the phantom mm -hmm. running through a glass plate window as well. So while, you know, it's it's it, it's similar, it's a similar concept and stuff like that, but um, it just, it did kind of remind me of that. Now, um, just wanted to show that. Now, Dan, can you see the error in this cover? The error in the cover. Yeah. <sighs> no, I can't. Look. No. Okay. What about the princess? She's a, a, a um, she's a, a white princess with blonde hair. Um, oh, you're princess... talking about the fact that because she's from um, Turkey, yes. that yes. Uh, she should be more Turkish in appearance. Yes, more Middle yeah. Eastern in the appearance. So it was just. Uh, but I wonder how if, if anyone else spotted that, if you're listening to this and you did spot and pick that up, let us know. Um, I, I, I've spoken to maybe, uh, I've spoken to a half a dozen people about it and I think one other person actually picked that up. So it would just be interesting to see whether anyone else picked mm. it up. Um, what she, what I be, really like. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just, yeah, no, uh, Go. No, no. Just, I was just going to say what I really like about both these cover, uh, both the, both these images, front and back, is that obviously Alex has um, had a copy of the story and mm. he's flipped through. And these these are probably two of the more dynamic parts of certainly part one. Um, and he's he's reinterpreted each scene. You can go through and yeah. find the the panel that has inspired it, but these are hardly um, swipes of the panel. Yes. Um, or, or it, it's a reinterpretation. It's a, it's a right there. Here's this scene. Let's look at it from another view, different mm -hmm. angle, that sort of thing. So you're looking at uh, page twenty uh, there. If you're on YouTube, hopefully you'll be able to see that. Where it's a, it's a totally different angle of the phantom running through the um, uh, through the through the glass. You, you, you're 100 percent correct. It's and I, and I I think that in my opinion that shows a good artist who can see a great action shot but it's you know it's not a swipe it's not a trace it's not a you know yeah. it, it's 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 his like you said it's his own work it's his own interpretation of it i really like it mm. um and then and then so we'll just quickly go on to 1890 we've got uh this is um uh, what do you call it this is actually a front and back that kind of merged together uh i guess a good Wrap way around, of putting it yeah, wrap around type of cover. Um, I really like this cover as well from uh, Marcelo Baez. Um, it's kind of like a collage, I guess. It's probably the best way to put it. I mm. like how he's got the what like, um, you can kind of see he's used squares to kind of mm. and rectangles and stuff. But you've got like the, you know the, there's a square there, but the phantoms over the top of it, and you know these bad guys kind of merging out of it. This would work quite well as a um, as a poster if Fru ever decide to um, you know do something like that for 
supernova or, or, or stuff like that again. That would that would work well as a poster. Hmm. Um, but no. Um, now I just want to quickly. Don't want to um, be the bearer of bad news for both covers. But uh, Dudley is wrong in his message from the publisher. This is not Marcello's uh, first cover. I oh, will. Oh, um, the latest illustrator. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, he's he, done he, one other one, which yeah. um, do you remember? Do you remember it? Oh uh, well, um, yes, I do. I think it was a Leonardo da Vinci type style, if I remember rightly. Um, I certainly knew that he had done a cover before because I've got him to sign my um, Fru family bag as a, as someone who's who's been part of the yeah. the Fru kit. So uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so that's from a while ago, but yeah, I've I've had Marcelo sign stuff for me before. Um, yes. He's also had a a bookmark um, as well, a bookmark and also a trading card as well. So yeah, mm. so um, but yeah, you know, it, it, you know, they can get it wrong occasionally. Um, but no, uh, some great covers. Uh, it's good to see. Um, obviously, Marcelo hasn't done many covers. He's only done one before. Uh, mm. Alex Tripp is an up and coming. Uh, I think, I think he's even younger than me. I think he might even still be in his 20s. That's how young he is. Um, or maybe in his early 30s. Um, so, yeah, I think he's got a – I think uh, Alex has got a huge future. Um, mm. in, talking to, in talking to Glenn about him, uh, he's very impressed with his work, very impressed. Um, so I, I would assume that we would see a lot more of Alex. Yeah, and and I'm with you. I like the Marcelo Bay's cover as well. The geometric shapes of it, the way that that breaks up the and and almost uh, is almost panels, I suppose, in a sense. But it shows how they're related. You've got the um, the cardinal who's overarching across both covers and um, showing the reach that he's got. So I I, it, I don't think it's unfair of Mar to Marcelo to say that I do prefer Alex Tripp's cover in this one. But you're right. I think if this was a poster, you'd love to uh, you'd love to have that in your folio. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. So we'll move on to the stories. What do you think about the stories? Um, well, I, I, I sort of consider it as, as one story. story yeah. um, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a rollicking ride. I thought the, the yeah. fact that it was set on a train um, that, was, that was progressing through Europe from, from Paris through to um, its final destination in Turkey, I, I liked that um, – that gave the opportunities for the vultures to come again, to come again, and to come again, and, uh, and Mr. Walker, from, for the most part, for the Phantom to um, repel all of those advances. Um, meanwhile, you've got the the head honcho um, sitting on the train conducting the whole thing. I, I really, I really enjoyed the the um, that that nature of the story, the way that it flowed, and and almost was told in in many chapters, not just parts one and two. Yeah, no, I I, I really enjoyed it as well for all those reasons. Um, uh, there's a, been a lot of vultures uh, in the last uh, last three or four months. We did call for it um, in our villain podcast. Um, we did. We what did you think um, vultures in on um, early in the part one story? I think it might uh, yeah um, page eight of the vultures story. They know, they um, Mr. Walker is introduced as the former the world's foremost expert on the vultures, and he says that they're a branch of Hydra. Now that's um, that's yeah. not something that's come out before. Um, Norman Workers obviously thought that that might be a cool idea. He didn't explore it in any way further in this story. Um, yeah, it's never you, been. What, it's would you never, like Hydra vultures to be part of the same? No. See, I, I wonder, and I don't have the answer to this, but I wonder if it's actually a, a, an error, like a translation error or something like that. Uh, whether it was actually in the original. Um, I personally, if I was editing it, I did pick that up as well. I wouldn't have said that. Um, I would have just removed all mention mm. of Hydra. Mm. Um, now I under I understand Hydra's got the you know the eight, you know, and you got your different arms and stuff like that. But it's I just think, sort of structure in a sense. Yeah, I, I just think they 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 work better separate. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I thought I read that and I thought, oh, that's that's you know, it hardly spoils the story because it's still a fantastic story. But it was just a little interesting point to note because one of the things, obviously, that uh, people who are as um, in, <laughs> ingrained in the fandom as we are are going to pick up on all these little nuances. So um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I would keep Hydra and Vultures as two separate entities. Um, would love to see some more Hydra stories, um, yes. but 
And it's interesting in the sense that the vultures don't really behave like vultures as we understand them in this story as well. Obviously, it's mentioned that for the most part that they turn up at uh, disasters or wars and uh, are, are looters, and the hence, hence the term vultures. Um, they don't really behave like this in this one, and uh, you know, with this kidnapping scheme to uh, to ransom the princess. So um, it's probably the most uh, proactive that the vultures have been in uh, any of the stories we've read recently. Of course, this was written in 1980, so it's a what 41 year old story, uh, first published in Scandinavia all those years ago. So um, yeah. That said, um, I, I like my vultures. <laughs> I like my vultures to be that um, that scum of society picking off the um, picking. But uh, and and maybe this was a yeah, might have been more suited to a hydro type organisation. This sort of scheme, but uh, but either way, it was really cool to have you know uh, the code names V three V four. Uh, V28, I think, was the biggest one we got to. V8 was probably the coolest one from an Australian uh, motorsports <laughs> point of view. But we now, never got to meet V1. Yeah, V1, that's a very interesting point. So, you know, what, what does it actually ever say what phantom, number phantom this 17. was? 17. Yeah, 17. This was the number 17. Okay, cool. So, um, it'll, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what V1 is. I uh, noticed that the highest official one that we did see was V2, which was the Countess. Yes. Um, so I wonder if, now I'm drawing a long bow here, but in our last Comics and News podcast when we were reviewing the um, the origin of the Vulture story, which I think featured the fourth Phantom, I believe it might have been. Yeah. Uh, there was Betsy, uh, was it Betsy or? Um, Elsie. Elsie, or, yeah, or whatever, whatever. Mm. Yeah. So I wonder if, um, and I know she can't be it because, but I wonder if there's a, a generational thing where, where you know, like maybe, maybe the leadership of the vultures is actually passed down from instead of father to son, from mother to daughter, um, and maybe V two was the daughter of V one, uh, who was the head honcho at that time. So um, it seems like a uh, a narrative you could explore, Jim. Time to map out a, a plot. <laughs> Uh, uh, just a you know a long bow, but um, it, it could be something interesting. With you know, no one would have thought of it like that. You know, we were introduced to uh, Peter Anderson's um, yeah. vulture, uh, female vulture, and then we see another female, a high official female vulture in here. So mm. yeah, it, it it could be something. Maybe um, maybe if you're a, a writer and you're listening to this, you can. Uh, create something because i won't be um <laughs> but um yeah what it does it's, say to me though the the publication of this story like i said before 41 years old norman workers writing um has not lost anything in the time especially because it's set in the 1880s or whatever it is um so that there's no there's no technological obvious changes or anything like that that appear in the story jamie valve's art is amazing yeah. as always like this must have been right around his sweet spot of um, of uh, production and the quality okay. of his work. Um, so um, I'm really pleased that um, that there's still room for these sorts of stories to be to be published, albeit you know many many well, four decades after they were first published in another part of the world. But then with the the covers, very modern covers, and both brand new artists in a sense, or, or, or um, mm. in, in a way, really modernises the story. So um, yeah, I think I think as a package, um, they're they're really good, and I'd be um, really open to to seeing more like it. Yeah, yeah, and whoever whoever chose or or said these would be good stories to to, to print. Um, has done a great job. Um, you know, they, these are great stories. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I'm impressed with the way they've with with these two issues from through. So um, yeah, I think they've done a good job. Uh, anything else you want to talk about these, or should we move on? No, no, that's fine. I, I'm I just yeah, really enjoy them. They are a story that I think I'll go back to and read again. Um, yeah, good quality yeah. stuff. Awesome. All right, so our next one is going to be uh, through 1891, which has, uh, which is everyone's favourite collector replica series. This is number 27. Uh, so this has uh, a reprint issue of through 119, 119, which was the Shark's Nest, 120, which was um, the second part of game, uh, no, which is the game of Elvis, sorry, and then 121, 
which is uh, part of the Cyban. Now you've got the the covers here, so you know there's there's a classic cover there from uh, which almost looks like something from Not the Shark's Nest. Um, there's one one twenty, which is you know so these these are, these are classic style covers mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, a lot of people. So I'm just trying to find the other cover, but I can't grab it for whatever reason. Oh man. It's not coming through. Where is it? Oh, I can't find it. But yeah, so the, you know, there's some great covers in here. Uh, the stories are great. Um, you know, there's three classic stories that a lot of fans do like: uh, the Shark's Nest, um, the Cyband, and also the Game of Elva. Um, however, you know, my biggest gripe is the fact of the way it's been presented. But you've heard that a million times, so I won't go into too much about that. Uh, Dan, have you got anything to add? Uh, just a couple of things. The, I, I certainly understand why people aren't appreciative necessarily of the stories as they come out. Yeah. Um, we've seen the Skyband. Um, yes, we've got part two here. We saw it published in uh, full oh, in colour yeah. only two years ago. So very few people are going to sit down and read this. I would have thought when they've got, you know, if, if they've got access to that uh, to that issue. Um, and even the game of Alvar was already done in a uh, in a replica only two years ago. And Shark's Nest, I guess, was um, 2014, so that's only seven years ago that it also appeared as in a replica. So um, it's not a long time between drinks. Certainly not the 20 years that uh, that we know Dudley um, sort of uh, has as his as his litmus test for how often a story can be reprinted. The thing that I probably enjoy out of these, and it's a little quirky stuff about um, the advertisements that appear in the stories. So it's a really cool way to see the original ads for some of those those really hard to find merch things. So I'm holding up page 96 there, which is a uh, uh, Phantom's ring that was advertised. Um, page 64 um, is another Phantom ring, a really cool ad. And you get to see the, the, the merch that we would have bought it, you know, a luminous stick pin for, for one shilling or a silver Phantom ring for uh, 10 and a half pence. Um, I think that's what the D means. I don't know. Um, again, you've got the on page 50 here, another ad for uh, Phantom merch. My favourite one probably though this time around is on page 32, which is advertising the, uh, the competition that they had back in the 50s for a 52-inch, uh, is it 52? No, it doesn't say, even say the size, an admirable t an admiral TV set. And uh, again, just sort of puts in, in historical context how old these stories are. That, was, that TV was cutting-edge technology at the time. Um, they were about to have a 48-page Christmas issue where they announced the winner of that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's probably those ads um, and, and putting it in the historical context that I enjoy flicking through, having a quick look at. Certainly don't read the stories, but, um, yes, uh, yeah. There's, so there's value in the, it, in the replicas in that sense, I think. Yeah, is it worth paying $10 for a couple of photocopies of some adverts? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, ten dollars is a uh, is a higher price point, isn't it? When you consider that we get a lot more value out of um, issues eighteen ninety and eighteen ninety one, which combined are less than eight dollars. That's seven dollars fifty for parts one and two of the Orient, Ex Orient Express, and then ten dollars for the the replica series. That, that that's a really fair point in terms of uh, the, the relative cost. So, if you were a young, so let's just say you lived your boy your, your dream and you became a boy again and you were having to spend your money on Phantom Comics, would you pick up this? Uh, it's a good question. It depends how generous mum and dad are with pocket money, I suppose, or how much <laughs> I'm earning on the, <laughs> on the newspaper run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's if, just, yeah. yeah probably or not. if you were a, say if you were, you know, you were older, if you were in your, you know, 60s, 70s, you're on a pension, would you pick it up? Yeah, again, with the the way the pension and uh, is meted out in Australia, no, <laughs> I don't yeah. think. This, yeah, I just yeah, like, like, like I can understand. I love the fact that through release old stories, um, and because you know these are the type of stories that a lot of fans, a lot of fans that listen to this, and a lot of fans uh, that don't listen to this podcast probably more fans that don't listen to this podcast will enjoy them all. But, um, you know, they, they love these stories. They grew up on them and, and stuff like that. And so there is that nostalgia 
uh, type of feel. But I remember when I was a kid. Now, I know everything's better when you're a kid. And so, you know, there's my pre-warning. But I remember the 100-page stories that I got when I was a kid always had a classic reprint, but then it always had a newer story as well. And then there was a forum letter in there. And I just mm. felt like, you know, and it's, this makes me sound really old, you know, back in my day, you know, when I was a kid, the 100 page issues were better than these ones. And, you know, just, um, you know, I, I, I just, I just feel that, look, we're close to 100. Let's please, 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 let's stop it at 100. You know, Let's stop it at 100. We don't need to get any more than that. It would be really interesting from a business point of view to see what the sales are like for Fruit. Are the are the only people who are buying these the people who are getting them through their subscription? That's certainly how I'm getting them. I'm also, you know, that OCD that I'm going to need every issue. Um, and most of us who are, who collect the comics do want to get every every numbered issue. Um, but it would be really interesting. I mean, if if it's if the sales aren't there, then they would stop doing it. That said. It's got to be their most cost-effective and, um, yeah. and profitable version of the comic as well. So, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. It would be their most profitable comic because let's let's face it. You just need you know one of the guys to scan in, you know, each because they would have these comics. Yeah, um, and to be honest, they've probably already scanned in down to fifty or you to would one. think so. They've probably already scanned them in. They're probably already sitting in a, you know, in a in a data file. And let's face it, uh, you know, a gig or you know a couple of gig worth of these scans doesn't really cost them any money. You know, Barry Stubbersfield has probably already written these these little intros and stuff like that. Um, so you know, you, you know, they only have to get the covers redone every, you know, every ten issues, which is every four years. Mm -hmm. um so or every two and a half years or whatever it is so you, you're right it is very cost effective i just from a from a collector's point of view and i understand i'm not the main target audience and that there is a lot of casual fans out there who buy them still from the news agent and stuff like that i just feel that it's just yeah again this will be the last i'll say on it on this podcast uh i just feel it's doing a disservice uh to the fandom community mm-hmm all right. As usual, uh, if you agree, you can let us know. Or if you disagree, which uh, hopefully there's some people out there that do disagree with us and uh, want to let us know, you can let us know about um, on us via our social media accounts. Uh, this podcast will be on our social media places as well as our YouTube and stuff like that. Now, if you do want to um, follow us on our social media, uh, you can. We're on uh, Facebook, which is chroniclechamber.com, so you just search for that. We're also uh, admins of the Phantom Collector Group, which is where you get to show and brag about your collection. Uh, if you prefer Twitter, we are at chronicle underscore tweet. If you are a grammar or an Insta, um, I you know the, or Instagram. If you're old and I think um, you're starting to prove your age in this episode, Joe. You can <laughs> talk about how you're the young buck, but I was uh, um, watching some movies and they were calling it the Gram. Uh, so if you are on the Gram, Billy um, Zane calls it the Gram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you could uh, follow us at Chronicle Chamber, um, and then if you like watching us on YouTube. Uh, which, yeah, if you like watching us, um, but never mind. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube if you search for Chronicle Chamber. Our website, of course, is chroniclechamber.com and you can find all our links and stuff there as well. Uh, so please let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, if you don't agree with us, uh, that is more than... Um, we encourage people not to agree with us. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to hand it over to Mikkel. Uh, Mikkel is going to be reviewing Phantom Man Issues 8, and nine of 2021 uh and then he is going to talk to us about uh some delivery news on the card game and then also he's going to give us his thoughts of the um uh best phantom Man story of 2020 and then we're going to go from there and then uh we'll so he's going to do that and then we'll come back and talk about that and pick it up from there and then we'll go from there so over to you Mikel. Welcome once more for some Phantom reviews. Today we have two great issues, issue 8 and 9 of 2021. 
uh, issue 8 is Andreas uh, Eriksson's first issue as editor. It has a cover by Henrik Salström, which is great as always. Uh, the main story featured in this um, comic book is Evil Lures, Lurks in the Night, written by Peter Andersson and art by Johan Boix. And uh, they decided to run it in black and white. My copy uh, had some issues at uh, cutting the pages, I think. I read it digitally instead. But uh, yeah, it's in black and white. A lot of people love black and white and uh, a lot of people say this especially works in black and white since it's a kind of a horror story about uh, yeah it looks a bit horror like this i don't want to spoil too much of the story uh, it's a great story by the way but uh, yeah they say it works really good because it's this horror element i say it works quite good when it these cave scenes and when it's in the middle of the night but I think it would work even better with a splash of paint on it uh, yeah cool story and PD is really growing in my eyes uh, we who only reads Phantom and not, not through have only read this and the uh, love story uh, with the McCoy art and I think it's nice to see that he can do a bit more serious story and not only the light-hearted funny and i mean he really knows his phantom it really feels like the phantom after this story we have this uh, kind of funny I wouldn't say article but it's uh it's it's like a traveling brochure for made up places in uh, in the world of the phantom written by andreas Eriksson. This art here by Jan Bilecki and uh, I got a special thanks for getting some of the images and uh, that Qu quite funny then we have a Lee Falcon Cyberry story and it's in color which I love and it's a really good coloring the story in itself is uh, it's about this mass wedding and then all of the sudden on the golden beach of Kilaui and then all of a sudden really close by there's these prospectors that can't find any gold but they're heavily armed to the teeth I would say but it's kind of short so it almost over before it started uh, so it's not that big of an impact uh, like mon many of their other great stories that's it for issue 8. Then we have issue 9 with a really cool cover by Luca Arbata, I would say. He's, I mean, his cover's getting better and better. He's really talented. Uh, this has a main story of Rock A's Stjärna that would translate to the star of Rock A. Uh, written by Daniel Carlson and art by Anthony Spey. But before that, Something that's really important to me personally is that I get credited to be the proofreader. Let's hope it's not only this one. We'll see in the future. And uh, yeah, I really, really love uh, space art. And it's nice to have a new writer. Chronicle Chamber wrote an article about him. Uh, you should really check it out. And don't know how to describe this story without spoiling too much. Yeah, you should just read it, I would say. I, I think this will find its way to through in the future. And uh, except for that, we have this side comic that is not Phantom. And uh, yeah, that, that was pretty good, but this is a Phantom podcast, so nothing more about that. We also got the result of the best adventure. And we got a preview of the upcoming issue. It will feature two new daily stories from Tony DePaul and Mike Manley. The column from Rodia and Unfinished Business. Or new, they're new for Phantom readers. They're not new for those who read the newspapers, of course. And then there's a classic, The Crazy Elephant. And uh, now I'm just translating freely. I'm not sure what it's called in English. By Lee Falk and Cyberry. And the end of this side uh, comic. 
And that finished the comic book section. Uh, stay tuned for the news. Ah, oh, great. You stayed for the news section. It starts now. And the first news, we have the first comic books by Andreas Eriksson. That is awesome. Second news, we have uh, a new proofreader in, uh, in the editorial. And that's me. And that's so fun. I hope to continue doing it. Then we have uh, a news of this, the best adventure of 2020. Uh, I've written an article on Chronicle Chamber. You should check it out if you're interested. But uh, mainly the two two top places is uh, Reckoning with the Nomad and Heloise Returns Home, two uh, daily stories. And in my opinion, well deserved, my favorite ones last year. And other news, uh, the Phantom the Card game, my game, is uh, hopefully, or DHL has promised it should reach the US uh, this week. So American and Canada Canadian backers should start receiving their games very soon. I'm not sure how long time it takes from the US to Australia, but I hope it's much, much quicker than Europe to the US. And so that everyone gets their game soon. Uh, I'm, yeah, I just hope it goes quick. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, back to you guys on the Chronicle Chamber. And happy phantoming. Alrighty, oh, thank you, Mikel. So, um, as we as we cut back from Mikel, he was talking about the results of the best uh, Phantom End story of 2020. Now, have you had a look over these results, Dan? I'm just doing it right now. Um, I was away for a couple of weeks um, for listeners over the over the Easter period, so I was out of. Uh, out of uh, touch a little bit, but I'm just looking now. So the winner was a reckoning with the nomad. Well, that's no great surprise. That was an absolute ripper yarn. Mm. So um, yeah, cool. So a couple of interesting points, which uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not sure if Mikel has already touched upon this or not, uh, but in case he hasn't, um, Tony D. Paul actually joins Lee Fork uh, as, uh, vote, as having the best story voted twice. Lee Fork only had that record, only had that nomination all that award twice throughout his career in the Phantom Men uh, magazine. So I thought that's quite interesting. And then Mike Manley uh, actually goes past Cy Barry. So you can say that Mike Manley is actually a more awarded uh, than Cy Barry because Cy Barry only got that uh, vote once and Mike Manley now has that vote twice. How long um, have um, Team Phantom Men been doing the, their best of competitions? Uh, since 78, I believe it is. Yeah, right on. So... To, to be fair to both Lee Fork and uh, Cy Barry, and we know we can always fudge um, stats to prove a point. Uh, uh, you know, from 1978 onwards, when they started this, let's be, that's probably their weaker point of their history. So it's understandable that, you know, that maybe not all of those stories got um, voted. And also Phantom Men didn't actually publish all of them as well. So... Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah but you know uh it's it's interesting so if if you look throughout uh the other thing that i've um uh want to quickly discuss as well um and i probably already know your answer um mm. is in the last probably the last five years we've been seeing better results from the newspaper stories and I was just wondering, do you think that's a trend or do you think that, uh, that, that maybe the newspaper stories are actually a little bit better than Team Phantom Men stories in the last five, ten years? Uh, yeah, I think they probably are. I think that Tony DePaul and uh, Mike Manley and Jeff Weigel, respectively, have um, really brought uh, a high level of quality to the stories over the last five years. I think the newspaper stories are knocking it out of the park and, and for the most part, um, you know, are, are really good quality. Now... Um, I'm not saying that Team Fenderman has dropped off in quality necessarily, but um, it's interesting to note that the the best Team Fenderman story as voted for 2020 um, was a reprint of a 1980s story, not not a new one. So what that says about the 
Um, the fans' perception of the quality of stories that are coming out at the moment, whether they're just not liking the new stuff from... Um, but there also wasn't a lot of brand new stories come out from Team Farnham in 2021 either. Uh, sorry, in 2020 yeah. either. So um, there was that more of a focus on the reprints. Um, so, but no, it, to, to answer your question, I think, uh, as I said, I think that Tony, Mike and Jeff are, are just absolutely killing it at the moment with the, the quality of what they're putting out there. And I think that's being appreciated uh, broadly by the fans. Yeah. And I also think that there's probably been... Uh, just in the English speaking ones that I've been following anyway, there's probably been more chatter about the newspaper stories uh, every day or every week uh, than a lot of the time with the free stories as well. And even also the team Phantom Men stories as well. So there's a lot of chatter every single day from, from fan and fans as well. Um, so I, I, I think, I think you're right in that the, you know, the, the reprint stories doesn't help. Um, but yeah, I think the newspaper stories are probably at the at the level of quality that we have not probably in the last five years. You know, every single story is at a high quality level that we have not seen probably until probably since the late seventies or early eighties, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it does remind me actually. We probably um, and we've said we're going to do this before, but it's just hard to to keep up. I suppose we the the latest daily story. Um, then came Towns Ellaby has just finished, and we probably should have done a bit of a review of that. Um, but uh, it, it just is hard to keep up with these stories coming out on a daily basis. So much easier to review them when they they come out in a in a comic book. Yeah, yeah. So all right, there you go. If you're listening to one of us, and you, if you would like us to review the Sunday and dailies as they finish in the newspaper, let us know. Or if you're happy for us to review them in the uh, comics. Uh, let us know uh, via, um, you know, via the comments, and then we will go with what um, the majority says. What we'll probably do also is do a um, uh, a bit of a, a Facebook um, or a, a social media mm. um, question as well, and then we could we can let the listeners decide yep. how they want us to review those. Just a, a question without notice: How do you read the um, the dailies and the Sundays, Jim? Do you follow them along on a daily basis through Comics Kingdom, or how how do you keep up with those stories as they? Okay, there's a Facebook page called the Skull Cave Chronicles, I believe it's called, which pub which actually puts them up every single day. So I don't always read them every day, but like majority of the time, like I'll you know read, and then if I haven't seen it for a while, I'll then go on to Comments Kingdom and mm. read, you know read like six months worth or something like that. But um. Mm. Yeah, it, it really depends. Um, but a lot of the time, yeah, majority of the time is I read them on Facebook when they get published, when they get yeah. um, put on. For me, it's others. probably because I follow Jeff Weigel and Mike Manley. So Jeff, every Sunday, will publish his, you know, that day's story, um, yep. which is how I read that one. And Mike Manley, once a week or, or maybe every seven, uh, eight or nine days, will publish five or six strips all together in one post. And um, th they are always in the black and white and not coloured, which is which is fine. I don't mind reading them that way. And that's probably how I keep up to date with the dailies. Uh, so I get them in a, in a burst like that. Yeah. So cool. So um, good to see that uh, there's a nice blend of stories being mm. uh, voted. Um, another interesting point is... They've the three stories of the um, uh, the fight against Singh or the twenty second Phantom ongoing saga uh, was voted upon as individual stories. But if you actually tallied those three together, it would have actually been uh, a higher a higher vote than the um, reckoning with the Nomad story as well. So maybe that might be something that the phantom and editorial staff need to look at is maybe part stories need to be done as a, as a sole story rather than um, uh, as, as individual stories. Well, that's certainly how we operate for the, for the through best of at the end of the year. And obviously um, everything that we do is the best way of doing things. And so other people need to, to copy us and follow it. <laughs> Follow our guide. <laughs> All right. Well, talking we about <laughs> talking about what um, uh, kind of doing what we suggested. Um, just wanted to give a, a quick shout out to the Malin Diaries. Um, I know you've received uh, your two copies as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have as well. Um, 
Now, just we're not going to do a long review because we've talked about this a bit, but you know, um, we've got a preview video. You, um, all the pre orders have all been sent out. The, the normal standard one and the um, exclusive one has all been sent out. You can buy these on the Fru website as well as contacting uh, Melon as well, uh, going directly through them. Now, a, a couple of things that I had questions about and stuff like that. Uh, first of all was this cover. Now, I wondered how the, the guilting, I suppose that's what you would call it, would look with this. I must admit I was surprised in how it did look that in my opinion it does look better in real life than on video or screen yeah. or photo. Yeah, um, if I was to be picky, I would have preferred the Doug Kaluba's image to be a little bit stronger, to stand out a little bit more. Um, but it, it does look good. It does feel nice. Um, you know, even the, down the sides are raised as well. Um, mm. So the print quality is great. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of information in there. I am impressed with it. Uh, obviously, the price point will be um, probably a sticking point for a lot of fans. Um, but even the standard one is good. I, I prefer the Doug Kuluba cover to the Cyberry. Uh, cover in my personal opinion um i just think uh it, it just matches it a little bit better um but that's just a personal preference you know if you real realistically you know you you get a little bit of extra fruit like you get the print and stuff like that with that one but this one is exactly the same information it's just not a limited edition so um you know if you can't afford this one Grab this one because you won't be disappointed with it. Um, but, yeah, so well done, Malin, for bringing that out um, and for the information and stuff like that. And, you know, there is um, a whole bunch of acknowledgements and stuff like that from fan and fans from all around the world. Um, just to kind of give you a bit of a taste, there's uh, Doug Kaluba, Simon Trenshaw, from, who's from Denmark. Uh, there's us, of course. There's uh, Swarut. Uh, Chan, who's uh, a Chronicle Chamber friend, who's from India. Uh, Marco uh, uh, Davidic, who's from uh, uh, is it Serbia, who's also Libya. been on the podcast as well. Gary Horn as well. So you know, there's some good, um, uh, there's some good uh, international flavour uh, all around the world and on different con continents mm. as well. I um look I, I unashamedly really love this book. I think that it's um it's come out really really well. Um I probably and again um I haven't haven't discussed this with you Jim, but I'd probably be uh, love to have some of the listeners or viewers do a review of this themselves and send that into us just to because I feel a bit awkward. We did the preview and that sort of thing, but obviously having contrib being contributing editors such as we are, um, it's a bit awkward for us to then go and review the book and, um, and give it probably a uh, that that. Uh, objective um, eye. So yep. if you're out there and uh, you've, you've picked up a copy of the book, I would agree with you in terms of um, uh, the, the limited edition looks better in real life than it does um, in pictures. And I think that people who are going, oh, that the price point's really expensive for a Phantom Diary need to, you know, and we've said this before, they need to actually pick it up and have a flick through it to go to realise that this is a step above what Melon are known for, I guess, in their diaries before. Um, so yeah, um, if if you're listening in and uh, and feel like you'd like to do a bit of review on it, and you can be objective and um, give us a a, a neutral perspective, um, I'd I'd love to hear from people who want to send that in. No worries. So again, we'll probably put up a social media post as well, so people can um uh, don't just have to listen to the podcast to hear about that. But yeah, uh, it'll be nice to have a, a fan review of Melon Diaries as well. Cool bananas. Okay, so now we're going to fly through some other news. Uh, as always, all these news are on our uh, on our website, which is chroniclechamber.com, um, and then also on our social media um, uh, platforms as well. So we always do post it on there. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about the Sydney Mecca weekend. Um, we have the uh, Leaf Fork Memorial Bengala Explorers Club, or the Limp Bic, 2021 dinner has been announced and the details on that are on our website uh just a couple of notes um that this is by invite only so it's not open to every tom dick and harry or every fan 
Um, you know, there is a website, uh, which is uh, lfmbec.org. If you want to find out more information about the, um, the the dinner there, and if you can subscribe to uh, all the latest um, stuff that comes up from there, so and then also a quick note out to those who are attending: uh, make sure you get your items uh, sent to uh, the organizer Richard um, with photos and stuff like that uh, to them to organize um, for auction. So all the all the proceeds for the auction do go to uh, Westmead's Children's Hospital as well. Um, so Jim, you said invite only, and and um, so how do people score themselves an invitation? What do you, what do you need to do to uh, to get the call up? Okay, so if you if if this is something that you might be interested in attending, um, the the website, uh, the Olympic uh, org website, you can um, you can subscribe to there, or if you just send us an email, which is at chroniclechamber at gmail tell us uh, that you want to obviously. And then we can pass your details on to the organizer. Now, um, so yeah, so it, it, it it's not supposed. To, it it might sound a little bit like a, a secret organization brotherhood, but it, it's not like that. It's just that um, you know, obviously, there you know, it's not an invite out to everyone. You can't just buy your tickets out at you know Eventbrite or or Ticket Ten. Mm-hmm. So it's just, um, you know, it, it's very easy to join. Um, there's been, you know, probably an influx of joinees probably in the last five years, probably double the number. So, yeah, so it's pretty easy to do. Just uh, follow those steps and it's pretty easy. Now, normally what happens with the Olympic dinner is we have the Sydney Supernova as well, which will be going ahead. Obviously, with COVID, uh, there is a bunch of restrictions, so there's likely not going to be many international um, uh, guests at Sydney Supernova. Now, probably the last, what, uh, the last three, four years, there has also been through that have been at Sydney Supernova as well. Now, there is no official announcement yet, but from what we understand, and we have got it on fairly good authority that fruit won't be attending Sydney supernova this year. Now, um, the exact reasons, uh, we don't know. We can guess and assume and, and stuff like that, but, um, yeah, they won't be attending super Sydney supernova this year. So while that's disappointing, um, one way you can look at it is that it probably allows you to not have to spend as much money and also maybe spend some money uh, elsewhere besides just the fruit booth. So there will be a lot of artists there which will have prints and posters and you can get some sketch covers, commissions down at Artist Alley and, and all that type of stuff as well. So I'm sure if you are still planning on going to Sydney Supernova, you will still be able to spend lots of money, but maybe not just as much, which will probably keep all the wives and partners happy. Well, you'd like to think, and I certainly understand um, the the concerns Fru would have about trying to put together something for Supernova. I'd like to think that there might still be some of the um, cause over the last, like you said, three, four years, there's been the launch of various products, um, that Fru have, have had at Supernova probably highlighted most recently by, um, the, the card, uh, the cards, the trading cards in 2019. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, w- I would like to think that they would still have some new products in the works that are going to just appear on the website. So, uh, you may not save yourself that much money if they're, if they're still- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, look, th- they will have new products. Um, we've, we know of one new product that will probably see uh, the light of day around that time, um, but it probably just won't. You won't be able to pick it up at, um, at Sydney Super. Are we at liberty to share with the listeners what that might be? Or uh, I don't know, but it could be a new <coughs> graphic novel. <coughs> um, <laughs> decipher that if you can. You that um, COVID over in Perth, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Look, yeah, I no, we're not, but we kind of did. But um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just getting handed a water. Obviously, uh, that cough did did get heard all the way from uh, the rest of the house, so I better wet my whistle. Um, <laughs> so, look, yeah, there will be new products this year. Um, there's some, I'm sure there'll be some cool ones where we can spend money. Um, but yeah, are you going, Dan? Oh, I don't think I will, mate. It, it's got to do with a couple of things. One, um, as I said before, just being away for the last couple of weeks um, out of contact, that was a, a fair chunk of time. To be away from the family and that fishing trip wasn't 
cheap either. So uh, I, I did have to dip into my phantom savings a little bit to go fishing. Um, and uh, and so the, the money's not necessarily there. And there's also the risk about travelling into state. I know as far as we go in Australia, we are very, very lucky. And, you know, there was 85,000 people at the football yesterday. And for the most part, you know, there's um, there's... I think it was 78,000 in the end anyway, but but still a huge group gathering and, and there's pretty free interstate travel throughout Australia. But but as that said, Perth is in lockdown right now. Brisbane was in lockdown three weeks ago. So you just never know. Um, and uh, and without, the, without the through booth being there and all of those artists who get together and um, and that, and uh, yeah, I'll probably give it a miss again. Again, um, the the dinner, Lee Fork Memorial Bangalore Explorers Cup dinner. I really enjoy going along to that. Um, certainly, we'll send something along for the auction. Still, um, I know Chronicle Chambers making a donation. I've got a, um, you know, lots of people send in personal donations as well. Um, but again, the. the the guest there is not someone like if it was a Cy Barry or a Jeff Weigel or a Tony DePaul who was going to be at the dinner. Well, yeah, I'd probably think harder about going, but uh, yeah. So probably not at this stage. Yeah. Probably a good idea. Quickly mention the donation. So this will be one of the donations. Uh, it was about two years ago, maybe three years ago. Um, we partnered with Sal Valuto and Eugenio uh, Matt. Uh, was he? Aussie, Matt, Matt Aussie, um, with some with some beautiful prints here. Uh, there was only, I think there was about 50 of these created. Uh, we imported about 20 of them. Uh, and so the plan was is that we were going to donate one. Um, so there's the eight prints there. So this is the last one available. Um, so, the, yeah, like I said, there's about 50 of these. Um, so that will be one of the donations as well. Uh, from Chronic, from the team at Chronicle Chamber and also Cell and um, and Eugenio as well. So, I, I myself I won't be going. Um, similar reasons. I, I wasn't planning on going, and then I kind of started getting um, uh, FOMO when everyone started talking about it this week. And then I was thinking, oh, how can I do it? And then Perth went into lockdown, and it's, it was a it was a nice reminder that. Not this year. Um, you know, one or two people get COVID in the community and then, you know, everything shuts down. So it's just, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've got some health scares and stuff at the moment. So we've got to be, we've got to be health conscious. We've got to be, um, you know, safe and stuff like that. But in saying that, if you can't make it to Sydney, uh, it is worth mentioning that all of the supernovas are still happening in the other, in the other cities around Australia. So, I believe Brisbane or was it Gold Coast had one. Was it about a week ago? I think it might have been. Yeah. Uh, Melbourne's got another one Gold in Coast, May. Maybe. Yeah, Gold Coast. Melbourne's got one in May. Um, then you got Sydney Supernova in June, and then Perth is the week after. So um, you know, unless things change, you know, there's still. And then I think Brisbane. And then you have uh, Brisbane again and Adelaide, I think it is, which will be in November t- time, I believe it is. So they're mm-hmm. still happening around Australia. Um, a lot of the uh, – there's a, there's definitely more phantom-related creators that go. Uh, like, you know, Jamie was up in Brisbane and, you know, the one in Sydney, the S- Sydney Comic Con had 11 related guests and stuff, a phantom-related guests. So there's, there's definitely there's, – I, we would suggest if you feel safe, if you feel secure and you're in confident in going, go out, support the Comic Cons, uh, spend some money there, uh, get some phantom signatures and phantom sketches and stuff like that as well. Um, and then also do a shout out on social media if you're going to say the Perth one, put up on the post, hey, phantom, phantom fans from Perth, let's meet up and you know have, have some catch ups with some other fans and stuff like that as well. Again, only if you feel safe. Yeah, I certainly think, um, because I think the Brisbane one will be in September or November. Um, I haven't checked the dates on that, but I'd I'd be looking forward to going to that one. You'll go to the Perth one, I assume? Yeah, go to the Perth one. Uh, I'll take my take my kids. Um, meeting up with a couple of Phantom fans from Perth. I think we've got about four or five other uh, Phantom fans from around here. Yeah, they do exist. Uh, shout out to Callum, Daniel, uh, Bert, and uh, some of the other guys as well that will be um, will be meeting up. So yeah, so it should be good. Hmm. 
All righty Okay, so a couple of bits of news from Phantom Man, uh, which is exciting. Um, so there is a new Phantom Man writer who has just uh, created a new story. Now, his name uh, escapes me, so I'll quickly go on to our website. His Daniel, name Daniel is Carlson. Daniel Carlson. Yeah, that's correct. So he wrote the story in Phantom Man 920. 2021, which was released on April 15th, which was um, reviewed by Mikel uh, a couple of minutes ago. If you want to go back and listen to that, you can check our timestamp details, which are in the description uh, below the video as well. Now, uh, interesting, he was uh, used to work with Mikel, uh, Mikel Sol. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting how things have kind of come full circle. So he was, um, his role at Egmont was as publisher and development manager for several of the comic titles, including The Phantom. So, um, yeah, we've got a, we've got a link um, up there where you can learn a little bit about him. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now, the other bit of exciting news from Chronicle Chamber is that um, uh, Mikkel Lick, who everyone knows, everyone loves his card game and stuff like that as well, he is on the um, staff of Team Phantom Man. That's uh, pretty exciting news. Um, it, I know. I, I remember seeing um, your reactions when you came back from holidays when you found out about that one, uh, Dan. Yeah, I, 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 good on him. Um, I think he would probably he'd probably quibble with you to say that he's on staff. He's a what is it, a consulting proofreader or something like that. Um, but he is getting credited, as as my understanding in the in the magazine for his work there. Um, and uh, almost a, a bit of a labour of love is the way that he describes it. So it's it's hardly like he's going to quit his job and uh, and rely on his work with uh, Tim Bunterman <laughs> now. But uh, no, good on him for uh, for being able to to translate his good work with the card game and and of course um, with Chronicle Chamber. Um, and I'm really really stoked for him. He, he's really excited to to be able to read the stories um, and and do a bit of proofreading. And I think as much as anything, he's uh, he loves the fact that he's now reading them ahead of time and and seeing the stories before everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon that's probably the uh, the best thing he gets out of it. Um, it, it it's been good because uh, on the videos he's he's pointed out little errors and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So if you were umming and ahhing about um, doing our review before, well, maybe this could be a, um, a good opportunity for you to uh, to prove your worth by reviewing the Malin Diary as well. Um, there you go. Because <laughs> he's, not the, he's, not, he's not the first person that's been uh, brought on staff because of the stuff he does at Chronicle Chamber. Uh, so yeah, so no, that's, 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 it's it's great to see new people out at Team Phantom Man and stuff like that. Um, obviously, they're going to need it with uh, Clayce Ramifi retiring. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that's 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 going to be good. Now, some more exciting news is that um, there's a new French publisher. So Editions Dante, which in my English way of pronouncing that that's how it sounds but it's probably not that uh so editions dance we'll call it like that is a french publisher uh which um from what from what we understand now information's still a little bit sketchy on exactly what they're doing and everything uh because they've had some issues uh the sync pirates who have attacked their website um and stuff like that so they actually had to get a new website uh, because um, it was unrecoverable. So that was a little bit hard to try and write an article when um, uh, they just like through uh, a, a couple of a couple of comic guys uh, doing some some publications. So there's you know there's not a huge staff and you know the the main guy is also the webmaster and the social media expert and everything like that as well. So um, all power to them. So their first issue. Uh, is actually collecting uh, the French Canadian um, I issues, which were published back in the, um, I think it was, yeah, 1975 to 1977. So it's interesting that they're going with those stories, um, but it's good to see another publisher uh, in, a, in, a, in a country like France, which has a strong uh, tradition uh, 
back publishing the Phantom. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's a, a curious collection of stories that they've got there for their first edition, and probably not the ones that would first spring to mind for people to say, "Well, these are going to be some some classic or some sensational stories that are going to help um, launch your your yeah. production." Um, you know, I, I think compare that to Regal in India and the stories that they've used to launch their English speaking series, at least. Um, a lot of them are absolute classics, uh, more modern classics, I suppose, with the uh, Tony DePaul um, stories. Uh, but none of the ones in the French comic are going to be um, newspaper stories. They're all those, like you said, the, the late 1970s. I wonder if that's because they already existed in, in French and didn't need translating or, or what that might be. But, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's fantastic to see that um, another country is um, getting back on board with the Phantom, France having yes. not had any um, locally produced Phantom comics for, for a while. Um, so that's really good to see. And, and all the best. I, I really hope that it takes off and, and they have fantastic sales and um, get to the point where they can be um, producing some other stories that are either more familiar to us or, or you know, touch wood, even producing their own would be fantastic. Yeah. So if you are a, um, if you have already received this, if you're from France or or Canada and you have got this comic and you want to do a review for us, please get in touch with us, chroniclechamber at gmail.com. I probably will be getting a copy and I can probably do a, a quick review. But again, I'm not a French speaking person and it's going to take probably a while for it to come over here as well. So it means mm. it will be delayed, which will be a bit of a bummer because, you know, the, the interest will probably have not uh, be as high as it probably is at the moment. So uh, again, if you know, oh, we know a few uh, French fans and Canadian fans out there. Um, this is a call out to you guys. Uh, do a quick review of it for us. That'll be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. All righty So um, some, another bit of news is that the traditional Phantom Moon softcover album has had their cover released, which is another classic um, um, image, I guess you could call it, from Luca Roberto. He's done the last um, three or four, the last four. Mm. Sorry. Uh, the theme of this one is uh, Rough on Roughnecks. We've had uh, Phantom Noia. We've had um, the Pirates theme and we've had the Wedding theme and stuff like that before. So, um, yeah, it, it's good to see that um, Phantom Men are continuing with this series. Um, I like the themes. I like having Luca creating the stories. Um, so, yeah, so it's good. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, having had a quick look at that, uh, that cover there, again, Luca's just... Um, you know, he's a fantastic artist at the moment, produced in, in the Phantom world, and uh, it's great to see more of his work. Um, I yeah, see he's yeah. starting to, to um, sell some of his originals online right. as well, um, and, you know, I'd love to have one of those in the collection um, because the, the attention to detail and the, the confidence in his line work um, is, just, is just sensational. So, mm. Well, what I actually like is in a lot of his covers, he doesn't actually use lines. It's all shading and uh, that waterfall one that he'd done, um, if you're on YouTube, I'll have yeah. it uh, here with the the original one and stuff like that. Like, it's it's almost just a shading. It's 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 really, really nice. Um, that's probably my favourite cover that, that uh, probably along with the Pirates one, mm. it's probably my two favourite covers that he's ever created. So it's good to see that um, he's still creating very good covers that um, that get a lot of interest as well. Yep. All righty Dan, we have managed to go through all of the news. So um, uh, that's pretty cool. It's just over an hour. Um, and then once uh, Mikel adds in, it'll probably be about an hour and a half because he likes mm. to talk. Um, so we'll quickly... Sad there weren't more uh, through comics to talk about. In a sense, um, you know, every month we used to be able to get a, a Phantom's World or a giant size or a kid Phantom that was uh, part of the root, the rotation as well. So mm -hmm. it's a little sad that we're, we're down on, on numbers, but it's, uh, it's also good to just, uh, you know, rip in, pump out a, a podcast about uh, everything that's been happening and uh, look forward to the next lot. Yes, exactly. So, so again, our website, if you want to follow us or 
read all of those news that we've talked about, uh, chroniclechamber.com is our website. Uh, email address is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Uh, if you wanted to contact us regarding reviewing the Melon Diary and all the French Canadian mm. comic, uh, please contact us via there. Uh, a huge shout out to our new Patreons. We have the Clay Camel. Um, which is actually a Mandrake reference uh, right. for those who were not sure. Um, so it's good to see a couple of Mandrake fans getting on, getting involved as well, and also Joe as well. Um, now, there has been a, recently a huge uh, upgrade on our P3, or yep. update, sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, Dan, do you want to quickly, uh, do you remember at the top of your head what you added in there? No, but I'm going to a very handy website <laughs> called chroniclechamber.com because um, I'm sure I at least drafted a post uh, April Gold. There we go. Um, <laughs> so there was a whole bunch of newspaper articles that uh, that got added as well. We, we, we still um, have dozens and dozens of newspaper articles that we're continuing to scan and upload. Uh, so another 26 of those from Australia, particularly um, from around 1999 and, and obituaries of Lee Fork went in this time around. Um, we've got the the current, um, no, sorry, the 2020 KF, KFS style guides that were there, um, some video files as well, which is always really popular. Um, a couple of interviews with Cy Barry from his time in Australia in the late 1990s, as well as some um, interviews with Billy Zane from around the movie. Um, a few more uh, files from the official Phantom Club, you know, continuing to dig up letters and adverts and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the my favourite things, though, to to go through as I uploaded them this time was the um, the website landing pages, the images from the the original movie, the not no, the original movie, the 1996 movie. Remembering, of course, that this is only three years after the internet was even available in Australia, mm. um, I distinctly remember at university going to that website and um, some of the images of the, the various rooms in the Skull Cave um, were, were some of the more stunning images I'd seen on the internet at that time um, in its infancy. So we've been able to um, obtain those those files and, and lots of people wouldn't have seen those for a couple of decades because that, that website's long gone now. So um, if, like me, you had fond, mem fond memories of uh, jumping on the, the 1996 website, there's a bit of nostalgia there for you. Um, or for a lot of people, it'll be the first time you've seen it. So there's a, there's a whole range of extra stuff that we've put into the P3. It um, was a little while between drinks, but um, great to see that, that that digital library of phantom stuff continues to expand. And, and uh, I hope that all of the people who jump on as patrons have the time to go through and look at various things, you would need you'd need a dedicated month to go through and try and look at every single thing. There's just so much there, so the index will guide you around. You can see what's there, explore it at your own pace, and uh, yeah, there's a. I think personally, I think there's a lot of value there for your five dollars a month uh, as a supporter. So thank you very much to all the patrons, and I hope you get a lot out of that. Definitely. So um, as normal, you can subscribe to us on uh, iTunes or Spotify uh, or apps like Podbean. Player FM, Castbox, or Listen Notes. Uh, if you want to watch us, you can uh, view us on YouTube as well. Now, I've had a couple of people ask me about the question um, that we asked um, Ben Rapp, uh, and then the question that he asked his agent. Um, so the answer is yes, he has heard back from his agent. The answer. Well, you'll just have to keep tuning into our um, social media on our website because we will have an answer to you very soon. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to us. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us. As you can tell, my kids are awake, uh, chatting and making lots of noises in the background. Uh, they are three and seven, so uh, you kind of expect that. I hope they're not too noisy for you. Thanks for listening to us. Uh, and for myself, happy phantom. Happy phantoming, everybody. He washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The phantom, the ghost who walks. The phantom, enemies beware. The phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. Find you.